Music Scene Investigation is on the air. Rich Wildman here with you. How are you, everyone? Glad to see you again. Glad you joined us. Let me get rid of some of that junk over my... You know, sometimes I forget to push buttons. Sometimes I don't. Looks like today is one of those times when I did, but that's okay because it's all good now. I'm glad you're with us, everybody. We've got a heck of a show for you today. A couple of surprises, and uh, who knows what else is going to happen today. Of course, you know what happens here on Music Scene Investigation. Each week, we get our panel together to listen to new music from indie artists that are randomly chosen and heard for the first time by our panel as they hear it live on the show today. And, of course, you get to hear it as well in our audience. We're so glad you're with us. We certainly hope that... uh, The music's good. I say we hope because we never know what we're going to hear until we hear it live on the show. Every song is randomly selected from those that have been submitted. We'll choose three each week for the panelists to hear. They'll provide their critique and review after they listen to it. And then by the end of the show, we'll select a song of the week. That's how it kind of works around here. It's very cool and uh, pretty fast paced for the most part. And, uh, Uh, Just welcome you to it. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's meet our panelists right now. We're going to start out. Well, we're going to stay across the pond for the whole day because everybody on the panel is from the United Kingdom. It's very cool unless, of course, you're me because I'm going to get ganged up on today. I can tell it. All right. Here is Ian Husbands. Hey, Ian, how are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to have some British friends on board. Yeah, I know you are. You were you were going on about it before the show, and you know it's going to be a massacre. Or what can I say? Just waving the banner for the UK, Rich. <laughs> yeah, I see that there in chat. Yeah, you you're mean like that. <laughs> How are things going? You're wearing your shirt with your picture on it again today. Uh, it's my Ian Blackwood. Um, And the Bipolars t-shirt. I've seen Ian Blackwood. I've met Ian Blackwood. You look nothing like Ian Blackwood, but the shirt looks exactly like you do. In silhouette, we look very much alike. Yeah, I don't get it. (laughs) I don't get it. All right. What's been going on the last week? We've uh, not seen you since, of course, last Sunday. I know. I was, I was, uh, yeah, I was here. Present and correct. Yeah, I know you were here. I saw you here last week. I was. And what's been what's been going on? Work, 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 and work. Got a lot going on at the moment. Still working on this top secret Lego animation, which is coming along very nicely. I'm glad to hear that. And we've got another track and video in concept at the moment, which is going to be rather good. Well, good. I'm I'm well, glad. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, uh, keep us up to date on that. Keep you know, let us know how well, it goes. We're getting like custom made cajons and uh, bits and pieces done for for a live sort of video, um, so that's going to be quite interesting. All right. Well, uh, we'll see how it goes. I guess, huh? Yeah, we'll see how it goes. All right. Well, we'll look forward to it, <laughs> and uh, like I said, keep us informed on what's going on there, and we'll see how things turn out. All over again across the pond. I'm going to say that a lot on today's show. I feel. James Anderson with us once again. Hey, James, how are you, sir? Hi there, Rich. Everything seems to have gone strangely wrong technically. My myself on the screen, which is probably just as well, but the chat room's finally working as well, so I'm quite pleased about that. Yeah, the, uh, only, the little... only thing I have a problem with is your videos froze on me, and uh, every once in a while it kind of it kind of locks up. I'm not sure... Might be a bandwidth thing between here and there. It's a nice still uh, he's got on there, though. Yeah, it looks yeah, good. Yeah, I can actually see the still. It looks okay, so I don't mind if it stays on that for a while. <laughs> uh, I've got a little bit of a plug. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about this. You've got some stuff going on that uh, we want to let everybody know about, and I hope you're still there. I hope you haven't oh. dropped off. No, no, so, no. I, I thought I had the... Yeah, we we want to talk about this because uh, I find these things fascinating. I I love going through them. So tell everybody what you got going on, James. Yeah, I had a little bit of a brainwave a few days ago and decided to publish one of my dissertations that I did during my music production degree. It's about the weird obsessive behaviors of record collectors and uh, whether or not collecting is an obsessive activity or if it's normal uh, anyway the title for it is labeling the record collector 
and it's available from Amazon.com and Amazon.co.uk. And today it's on a free promotion, so you should be able to download it for nothing. Well, that's so good. Feel free to do so and leave a good or a bad review, depending on what you think of it. So they can they, they can go to Amazon and download this thing today for free. Yeah, precisely. And... They can get it on their Kindle or smartphone app that uh, that runs compatible with the Kindle. So it should be read, readily available to most platforms. All right. Now they should be able to search for this again. What is the title of it? Okay. Once again, the title is Labeling the Record Collector. Labeling it's by the me, record. James Anderson. All right. Now, let me ask you a question about this, James. As we talked during the pre-show, I've, sure. I've, I had an uncle who was an avid uh, collector of records, had many thousands of records. And uh, is this something, you know, that you come to the conclusion of, or maybe not, that it is like a OCD or, or something along those lines? And would it be possible if someone were so heavily into collecting to be considered either A, a hoarder, or B, uh, disabled to the point where they could get uh, government help uh, or whatever to help them with their collecting problems, so to say. Well, this is certainly something that I cover in the book, and I won't give away my conclusion because I'd like you to download it and read it for yourselves. But Absolutely. certainly that is something that, that comes up, and one thing we discussed during the uh, the bit before the show was the fact that American collectors seem to have have it to more of an extreme level. But I think this is mainly due to the fact that there's more space available and space is at a premium in the UK. It's much more difficult to store thousands and thousands of records oh, that's in true. your house. Very true, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and, uh, I've, I've just noticed Ian's comment in the chat room and <laughs> he thinks it's an autobiography. And he's probably right. <laughs> because I'm, a, I'm an avid record collector but I don't take it to as an ex, extreme level as I used to it's only very small now there's only a couple of hundred uh, decent titles that I'm going to hold on to and not get rid of well fair enough and uh, as always if you need to collect something uh, more than what you have let me know I've got a little space over here you know I can hold <laughs> two, or, two or three of them for you no more than that though sure yeah, the only trouble is postage is so expensive that that might not be an option. That's very true. Postage is horribly expensive uh, between here and there, that's for sure. So but if there's anything on your wants list, Rich, let me know, because I'm usually out there looking and digging through crates. So All right, we'll let us do. know your wants list. Will do. There's no doubt about that. I want to bring our guest panelist in right now. Our guest panelist joins us for the very first time today, and we're pleased to have him with us. His name is uh, Paul Hurst, and Paul Hurst is a musician and producer who's been around for a little while, actually quite a while. He's uh, done some prolific covers on SoundCloud, some Gary Newman. If you're a fan of Gary Newman, you want to check these things out. Ian is a big fan of what Paul has done. And I got to say, if it uh, if it's got Ian's attention, I think it's uh, well worth taking a listen to. So I want to bring Paul in. Paul, you're not only a musician and producer; you also do a lot more than that. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, and uh, we can have everybody find out a little bit more about you. Um, hi, Ian. Um, nice to be on the show. Nice to be asked as well. Lovely. Um, well, as as you say. Um, I've been a musician for a long time now. Um, started music when I was about 11. Um, I'm 46 now. Uh, so I'll give you some idea how, how long I've been at it. Um, originally, uh, got into music after seeing the uh, aforementioned Gary Newman and hearing Gary Newman and thinking, this is just incredible. And it was just mind blowing for somebody of 11 to suddenly see and hear this um, otherworldly, incredible pop icon. And it just basically took me off to another world where I could explore sci-fi lyrics and sci-fi sounds um, to the point where I started thinking I'd quite like to be able to do this. 
Yeah, now I know. Um, One of the things that that I've been told about uh, your work on SoundCloud, especially your covers of of, of Gary Newman, is that there just have to you have to have spent a lot of time doing these because they're spot on. So what what motivates you to go through the amount? It's got to be a serious amount of time. What motivates you to go through that much time to make these things as perfect as what they are? Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's OCD or just artistic tendencies that I have or something. Um, I'd, I always used to be similarly minded when I was when I was a small child. I used to be playing with uh, with Lego bricks. Um, I apparently would spend hour upon hour just building things and creating stuff out of Lego. And then when I kind of discovered the music, that that became the next phase. And I I just sort of if I'm going to do something I tend to do it and I, and I literally dive into it and I, there's no sort of like halfway house with me it's it's either got to be done right or it's not not worthy um the the sound thing just this it, it became sort of um it was just just a discovery it was just always wanting to know how those sounds had originally been created um, and then trying to pursue that, but it was always that you were pursuing it like um, at such a lower level because you were never going to aspire to the amount of equipment or the gear that um, the likes of Newman or them were using. So I was kind of battling away trying to get similar sounds out of a Casio or something like that, you know. Um, it was only a lot, like a lot later on, even I would say in the last 10 years or so, since VST and sort of computerized instruments have come about, making it um, more affordable and available to get your hands on um, the similar sort of specification of equipment they had. Now, I know that you also uh, maintain a, uh, a degree in music production from Leeds College of Music. Uh, how has that come into play uh, with your music production, the things that you do? And uh, I know that this is something that you did fairly recently, uh, all things considered, in your in your lifetime. So tell us a little bit about that experience as well. Yeah, um, just well, just to clarify, so it's not a degree. I got a, an HND, which is a what's called a higher national diploma. Um, it was a course that used to run. Like underneath a degree and and okay. if you wanted to you used you used to be able to take like an extra year out afterwards and uh, an extra two years sorry and you could complete your degree from doing that uh, sort of fast tracked it rather than doing another three years and it's going to be the um, difference between the u.s and and the uk my mistake i apologize for that yeah yeah um but um it's it, it, it's a similar sort of course. It just doesn't um, maybe go into the same amount of amount of detail um, as a proper degree course did. It's it's more um, what, what kind of what they call a vocational course. So it's a lot more practical, um, and it, it, it's basically sort of a, putting you on a, a stepping stool to the next level of, of education. But um, I, as you say, I, I did that. Um, I, as what they call in this country a mature student, um, something I don't particularly ever aspire to being is mature, of course. But I, I was 32 when I went to uh, music college. Um, I'd studied music at school. I did, did O-level music and I did A-level music at college, um, but found that um, universities at that time were not particularly embracing electronic music um, there was very few music technology courses, if any, I think at sort of time um, would have been, would have been sort of like 1986 or something, I think it would have been when I was leaving uh, sort of secondary college. Um, and I just got very much, uh, well, anti-education and all that kind of thing, because I couldn't find what I wanted. I'd, I kind of rebelled and just decided I wasn't interested in the educational side anymore. Um, so to be able to then get the opportunity to go um, much older and possibly more mature, I think I got a lot more out of it because because I kind of, I chose to be there and I wanted to be there. Um, I I just, I just give it my everything. And um, there, there was a lot of kids there that, 
you know, at the age that you would expect to normally go uh, to a, a university, and then they they're just going through the motions of it. They they weren't getting out of it um, what they could have been because it was just the next step of their education, really. But uh, no, I absolutely loved it. It was it was, uh, it was probably one of the best two years of my life being there. Now, uh, I also know that uh, your experience in music and music production has made you a, a valued member of uh, the guys and gals over at G-Force. You're doing some work for them, uh, not mm -hmm. only on, uh, well, I guess it's, it's, it's quite involved work. I know that this is the case. You do some... Uh, beta testing and uh on on oddity 2 why don't you tell me a little bit about that because i'm i'm familiar with some of their software i'm not necessarily familiar with oddity 2 now i know oddity 2 is is brand new as well correct uh that's right yeah it was um literally released this week i believe if i remember rightly it's um it's on currently on what they call pre-release um so it's not actually available i think um i think it's december the first is the, is the official day when you can actually download it and get hold of it but it's on on a pre-release which i also believe is on um like a special introductory price so if you're interested in getting hold of it you know now's the time to snap it up and get it at, um, at a sort of a reduced price um basically what, what, what oddity 2 is is it's their development on from their original version, which was just called Oddity, which was we call Oddity One, I suppose, um, which came out uh, when would that have been sort of two thousand and two, two thousand and three, I think it was something like that. Um, and it's just literally taken that on to another level. It's 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 still exactly what Oddity One was. So anything that you were doing on it can still be achieved on this new one but just a whole lot more as well it's um it has it, well, it, it blow me away really because there's been so many enhancements on it to just sort of just make it so close to the original odyssey that it's i mean i thought the original one was but but, but what they've done to it now is is just incredible you've got you've got more choices there um and the big thing about it is it's now also polyphonic Oh, that's that's all. Which, as you can, it, well, it is. It's, it's it's as you can imagine. They, I mean, they're also um, uh, they, they did a, a recreation of the mini move, which which they call Mini Monster, um, and that again, they, that when they released theirs, they had the ability to be polyphonic, and of course, you can imagine if you've got the timbres of like a mini Moog, and you've always been battling away with it in monophonic mode, to suddenly have the ability to hear what it sounds like polyphonic and you know be able to play like washes of chords and all sorts of things with it that is now also available um essentially on an odyssey now i with odyssey uh, too i understand that uh from from my information here that uh, odyssey 2 is you're uh, available for pre-order through december 1st and uh when you pre-order odyssey 2 you'll be entered into a drawing to win an ARP axe. Now, uh, I'm not familiar with what an ARP axe is, so maybe uh, I don't know. Are you familiar with what an ARP axe is, Paul? Can you tell us a little bit about what maybe that is? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, to be perfectly honest, I've never used one, but basically, the axe was sort of the um, like the little brother of the Odyssey. Um, it's uh, like a single oscillator version. So, so the the Odyssey has two oscillators and a, and a ring modulator. Um, and the the axis, so it's got got the one oscillator, and it's a similar layout to the Odyssey, um, and you get similar timbres, but obviously just a little bit sort of thinner with, with only having that that one uh, oscillator on there. Um, but from what I've heard of the, of the axe, I've heard the, like demos and things like that on um, various sites and things. It's still a very very cool synthesizer to have. I mean, if if you think it's, it's like some of the other synthesizers that are single. Um, oscillators like say, say uh, Roland SH-101 and the sounds that you can get out of that um, I would say it's going to be sort of like it's got to be easily on a sort of level um, as that sort of synthesizer and I mean to, I would imagine as well if, if, it, if it's something that they're giving away it's going to be in tip-top condition oh absolutely um, and I, be 
I believe it's got a beautiful flight case coming with it as well. So, heck, I mean, you know, I would be, uh, I'd be entering the competition myself. Yeah, I, I don't blame <laughs> you. I don't blame you at all. In fact, we encourage everybody to go to G4 Software, take a look at Oddity 2, and uh, if you pre-order it, you're automatically entered in that drawing for the ARP Axe. So you definitely want to check mm -hmm. that out. Uh, do want to certainly hope you're ready, Paul, because we got some good music, hopefully good music coming out about, today to up, everybody to listen to. Ian wants to interrupt me as always. Ian, go ahead. I do. Before we go into this, we were offered an exclusive, and I think we need to take it. I think we need to pull to play us a little bit from this oddity. Yeah, let's let's hear something. Yeah, okay, please. Right. Well, it, it's. It's it's literally. A, a, I mean, if I'd been a slightly more prepared, I, I would have done something um, a bit more. Um, what I've basically done here, and it's only short, um, I've just whacked together a quick um, interpretation of um, Visage's "Fade to Grey," uh, which was a uh, obviously a huge hit in the eighties. Oh. And what I've done it done it with is um, a couple of bits of it are based on the Mini Monster, which is the Mini Moog emulation. And then anybody who's familiar with Fate to Grey will know it sort of starts off with this like portamento thing, which is done on the Odyssey originally. And then there's a solo that comes in a bit later on that's on the Odyssey as well. Um, but what I've basically done is, is, is all the sounds I've done on the Odyssey, including the intro as well. All right. Um, the, only thing that I, the only thing that isn't um, G4 stuff is the drums. That's just various bits of samples and stuff that I've got. But... Uh, Whack this through, and then if you give it a yell when you want it to stop. Yep, I sure will. Let's take a listen. Stop that there because we don't want to we don't want to give everybody too much of a listen to it. We want them to uh, go over and get their own version of Oddity too, so they can uh, make some great sounds like what you've made there, Paul. Sounds really, really good. It does sound great. And bear in yes. mind, we're listening to that over a Skype Skype feed as well, and that is an exclusive to MSI, ladies and gentlemen. No one else has heard that, so uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah. I'll probably I'll probably get that popped up on the SoundCloud at some point. But but as I said, basically every, every sound there except like that mini moog riff at the beginning of the boom, but da 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 da. the um like the pad sound that was done on the Odyssey. So that's like your polyphonic sounds you were hearing. The solo bit was obviously Odyssey uh, Odyssey, um, and it, just just to give it a flavour of 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 what it's um, available of you know available to do now. Uh, it sounds really good, and I wish we could sit and hear more of it. Uh, unfortunately, we have some other music we need to take a listen to right now, so I do want to go ahead and get to that. I'd like for everybody to take a listen right now to song number one on the broadcast today as we get some new indie artists in front of our panel. Here it is, everybody. This is song number one on today's Music Scene Investigation. Enjoy. Thank mm -hmm. you.
That is song number one on the broadcast today. We're going to go over to our panel now to find out their thoughts on everything. Starting out with Ian. Ian, what do you think about track number one? I like this. Yeah, I do like this. This has got that sort of 70s Doors-esque sort of rock and roll vibe to it. Um, obviously, missing the Hammonds for the, do- Hammond for the Doors, but, you know, Otherwise, you know, the guy's got a great voice. He's got a lot of character and a lot of colour in there, which I really like. And he puts in a solid performance like that. Uh, there's some background ums and oohs and ahs going on, and they were very washed out. And I would like to have heard them a bit more solid and a bit more backing up the vocal rather than sort of just floating around in the ether. Um, guitar time was gorgeous. I mean, it was. It was going back to that 70s vibe. Especially with the drum sound as well, very open, very sort of uncompressed, natural feel to the drums, which was nice. But from a personal opinion, you know, we live in an age where we've got the facilities to sort of get a slightly better drum sound. And I would have just liked to hear that drum sound a bit bigger, a bit meatier, you know, just a bit more compression on the snare, bring it through, snapping through, rather than setting it back in that sort of uh, in the the background like it was. You could hear it, but it was set back. you know, we've got the technology. I think we should be using it, not shunning it and trying to get a sound that sort of has 40 years past. Um, when you've got such a strong song as well, I like the arrangement of the track as well. I mean, there was people sort of in the chat room saying it sounded a bit born to be wild, but yeah, that's not a bad thing. You know, it's this good rock and roll vibe down on. The, the groove was strong. Um, the bass wasn't that complicated, but he really held the groove well with the, with the rest of the drummers. And the guitars were solid from a performance point of view. Um, I don't know. Some sort of wailing, wailing solo that sort of didn't really sort of take me. Uh, there was nothing in there from, from my point of view that really sort of just distanced that vocal apart from each other and, and gave it a, a bit more of a sound. But yeah, I like this. Good track. Good start. All right. I appreciate it, Ian. Thank you. Over to Mr. James Anderson. James, uh, track number one, your thoughts? Excellent. I was just wondering, is my screen still frozen? Yes, it is. But it's uh, still got that very good frozen picture of you on there. Well, since it's such a good still, we may as well keep it there and not try <laughs> and rectify it. Um, but going back to the track, yeah, that's that's really good. Really enjoyed listening to that. It did have a sort of 70s feel to it. Um, it reminded me of television in elements of that. It had a slightly new wave thing, and I could definitely appreciate where Ian was coming from with the doors angle there. It's definitely something like that going on. Uh, fantastic guitars and as uh, regular listen- listeners will know I'm partic- a particular fan of any kind of stereo <laughs> planning when it comes to effects and I like the way that they're bass positioned especially in the introduction uh, I think they missed a trick when it came to production I think there's nothing wrong in attempting a retro slightly lo-fi sound in places but those drums really would have benefited from sitting stronger in the mix. Um, I think they were recorded well, but it, they just came across as muddy and dead. And as Ian said, it was the right use of compression. You could really get the snare coming through. And I think the, the most salient point was when I heard those hand claps, they seemed to come across more than the snare, which isn't, well, you 
there's no rules, but I think it didn't come across as it should have done. Uh, what else is there? Fantastic track, good vocal. Uh, backing vocals could have been brought out a little bit more. Um, overall, I think this is a really good track and something I definitely want to listen to again. So hopefully uh, their stuff's easily available and they've got a good online presence. All right, well, we'll find out, but we want to hear from Paul Hurst first. Paul, what do you think about track number one today? Um, well, I think I'm going to have to probably echo a lot of what's what's already been said. Um, uh, that being said, it, it's it, I could it's not my cup of tea that kind of thing. Um, it uh, well, it's just it's just that whole just that just guitar thing and and that kind of uh, sort of strong throaty vocal sound and thing. It's just it's never got floated my boat that kind of thing, uh, but. Picking up on what what Ian said, um, my, my first thought when it started was 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 the the drum recording it, and it um, immediately made me start thinking about the the, the location of how it was recorded. Do you think is this a, a studio recording or just a basic demo recording? Because on a modern recording, it's it's it seems to me that it's nearly always something like the drums that give it away as to whether or not it's. Um, Either in a pro studio or actually had a um, you know like a really quality engineer on it, and the drums in this one for me did just let the song down. They would, it's like Ian said, it was just like a bit, a bit open, like it was recorded with just maybe just a couple of overheads or something. No real distinction to give it that real drive that I thought it could have had because because he said the bass was strong, um, and if they'd been a bit more definition and power to the drums, I think I think it would have pulled it along. Um, as far as the arrangement goes, yeah, again, I, I was thinking there was no solo that kind of broke it up and, and took you to like a different level. Um, the stereo imaging is very much akin to basically what, what you would see if you saw them live, I imagine. You know, you think drums are down the middle, you've got two guitarists, pan them left and right, put the singer in the middle. Wasn't hugely imaginative. Um, but for for what the type of thing it is... Um, it achieves its objectives, I suppose, but it's just it's it's hard for me to qualify because I don't particularly enjoy that kind of thing. I could go on for ages taking it apart, and I don't think that's really fair to do so. Um, not when I spend most of my time taking stuff apart and doing old things as well. So um, that, that's that's basically all I can uh, all I can think about it at the moment. All right, well, fair enough. I appreciate that, Paul. Thank you very much. And uh, let me introduce that track to everybody. The name of the track. As you can see there on the screen, it's called Knuckle Draggers, and it's by a group called Small Circles, and we appreciate Small Circles sending in the track. If you want to get your tracks heard in front of our panel, all you have to do is go to musicsceneinvestigation.com and click on the link at the top of the page where it says Submit Song, and you can follow the instructions there to get your song uploaded and heard by our panel. All right, we have two more songs to listen to, so let's go ahead and listen to track number two right now. Here it is, everybody, track number two on today's Music Scene Investigation. Enjoy. <laughs>
That is song number two on the broadcast today. And I would go over to James, but unfortunately, I've kind of lost him on Skype. So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, I don't know what happened. I'm, I'm looking at the screen there, and it shows that he's not answering. So what we'll do is uh, we're going to start out with Ian again, and then we'll go to Paul, and hopefully James will be back on by that time. So Ian, track number two, over to you, sir. Okay, right. There's a lot of this needs attention. Um, the bassist here, uh, rooted firmly in Alice in Chains and Rob Zombie and bands like that, is solid. I think there's a foundation for working with here. But there's a lot of things that need to be improved before you get to a point where you put stuff out, in my opinion. Um, now then, guitars to start with. Always check your tuning. Uh, the lead guitar, which was panned to the left for a lot of it, was, was out of tune. It could have been the way the string was being bent on the solo, or it could have been the actual tune of the guitar. Either way, it was sloppy. That needs tightening up. The guitars were very toppy, uh, lots of top end going on there, making them very harsh and very spiteful, too spiteful. They were blasting over the uh, the vocals. Um, the vocalist sounded pretty competent. Um, sounds like he's got some good ideas going on there. I said very Alice in Chains on the harmony work and the dual, dual vocal parts and bits and pieces like that, which is great, but it needs to be a bit more convincing. And obviously, with the mix being so unbalanced as it was, I struggled to hear him anyway. Um, Bass again, simple but too loud. Drums. We're having a debate in the chat room about the drums, whether they were programmed or real. I'm, I'm going possibly for a, a live drummer on a cheap le electronic drum kit. That's my guess. Uh, the, 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 the snare was very consistent. Uh, there was no sort of humanness to the sounds. The ride cymbal was very solid all the time. And But there were timing issues. There were lots of timing issues. Some of them rolls were off and some of the sort of feels into the... the choruses were wrong and yeah it was just all over the place a little bit and uh so this needs to get tighter i mean if you're aiming to be a band like alice in chains just go back and listen to alice in chains and listen to the way they time things and the odd time sequences they use and you know the, the not necessarily the straight four four drums and you know pay attention to what sort of genre you're trying to create and you know get it tight you know you've got all forms of tools out there for quantization of, of audio and midi these days uh, you're kind of running out of excuses for your timing being off. So uh, look into that a bit more. Um, and then get that mix sorted out. You know, bring those guitars down, EQ them better, take out that sort of horrible, nasty treble, treble sound. Get those vocals sitting together a bit more prominent in the mix with more compression to tighten them up a bit more. Um, you know, sort the bass out. Lots of bottoming going on. There's a lot to be done. But, it, you know, there's a foundation of a good track there. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Ian. We're going to go over to Paul right now and find out what he thinks about track number two. Paul, track number two, your thoughts? Noisy, loud. Ooh, guitars, nice. Um, it, I mean, my, my limited knowledge of, of this, this, this kind of music make, makes it difficult for me sometimes to be able to sort of give a, an objective opinion on it because I, I only know various things. I mean, I mean, I'm aware of Alice in Chains. I couldn't honestly tell you much about them but i mean the only thing that came to mind me when i was listening to this was, was like the likes of nirvana um uh, pearl jam things like that sort of sound is what was coming through to me with this kind of thing um my original exactly thoughts when it started was is, is that where we are, we are is it right yeah well, exactly my original same, yeah. thoughts when it's when it started it, it my original thoughts was like uh, ouch uh, just too much distortion you, you know you, you can you can have too much distortion on a guitar. Um, I mean, I, I applaud anybody that, that records guitars. It, it, it's the most difficult thing. I mean, that's, that's, well, apart from drums, I think. Recording guitars, I've always found complicated, and I, if I can, I steer away from it. That's why I do synths. I love synths. But recording guitars is, is one heck of a skill, and, and getting that balance between bite and just fizziness and top-end sparkly mess is really difficult. Um, I can remember once, years ago, I was doing um, just a little bit of work with a guy in a, in a, a local studio, and they were recording a, a thrash metal band at the time. And they had so much PA set up in the, in the studio 
because they, they, all they wanted to do was just capture this volume that they had live. And th th we had mic upon mic upon cabs all over the place. And it was just a wall of white noise at the end of it. And we were like, there's no distinction of pitch. There's just, there's, there's nothing other than noise. And um, th th they couldn't seem to appreciate that it was too much. You know, you think if you just pull it back, um, take that top end and get that tightness in there, and then it, it, you can actually hear the the pitch and you know the, uh, the the elements of the power cords and all that kind of thing that's going on there. Um, I agree again. I think with Ian about the drums on this. I, I was I was toyed thinking this sounds like almost like an electronic drum kit. Um, it certainly can't be programmed because again it was it was sloppy in places, and and I think that might well be what, what's going on there. It's a you know a real person playing an electronic kit. Um, Vocally, again, it's 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 not my bag that kind of rock thing, but it 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 was uh, delivered with its usual sort of um, anger and angst and gravelness. Um, I think I'm finding difficult with 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 both of these songs now, though. Is 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 any sort of real form of hook or anything? I sometimes you can hear you can pick out a, a, like a hook and a melody for a chorus after hearing a song once. Sometimes you maybe need to hear it twice, but but these, are, both of them, I, I'm not remembering anything now, and I know that they're finished, and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It is what it is, I guess, and I appreciate <laughs> your thoughts. Yeah, uh, you know, I understand where you're coming from. Now, I want to let everybody know we're having some technical issues with James. His uh, internet connection has started acting up. Sometimes that happens. It is the way it is. I mean, there's not a lot you can do about that if... Uh, if the connection doesn't want to work, it just doesn't work. And, you know, that's kind of the way it is. So what I'm doing is I'm waiting on him to give me a call back on Skype, and I'm going to keep an eye on it over here and uh, try and get him back online with us. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to go straight into song number three after I introduced this track to you. Song number two, it was called Deprived, and it's by a group called DNA App. DNA app, and we appreciate their sending that track into music scene investigation as well. So let's go into it with track number three right now on music scene investigation. Hopefully, we'll have James back online with us at that point. But here it is right now, everyone. This is track number three on today's music scene investigation. Enjoy.
get home at six o'clock. Seems like this crime don't ever really stop. Smoke a bowl to give myself some soul. Seems that all these people just don't really ever know how I go. The heart of God is try And when you go, I'm never asking why. 'Cause yeah, you got me drifting away, away. Yeah, you got me drifting away. Say that I love her. She loves me. Well, gets in the way. We'll make it so sorry. I love her. She loves me. Well, gets in the way. We'll make it so sorry. Better quit stepping on my feet anymore. Know that I've been telling you this once before. Second time around, it will be twice. Second time around, well I won't be so nice. Need to quit cutting my baby down. Ain't a fault that she grows straight from the ground. Need to quit cutting my baby. She grows straight from the ground. That is song number three on the broadcast today, and we're going to go right back to our panel to find out what they thought about it. This time, we're going to start up with Paul to get his thoughts first. Paul, what do you think about track number three? Yeah, I like that one. Um, um, of, of of the three we've heard, uh, th- th- that one I think certainly is is the nicest uh, recording. Um, you could you could immediately tell that the, the drums they just sound um, experienced, you know, and, and it's certainly an experienced player there. Um, it was tight with the bass, then the bass is not a lovely sort of simple, uh, slightly reggae inspired line there, and the two of them were really solid. Um, what I also liked is the fact that they gave um, room for the song to build, so it kind of starts off sort of relatively loose and spacious, and then in that kind of bridge section before the choruses, it it, it um, drives harder when the guitars uh, come in. Um, what I possibly would have liked is 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 being a keyboard player is a bit more keyboards. I mean the the roadie piano thing was lovely, but maybe in those built sections maybe get some sort of washes of pads going in there or j- just something of extra a little bit of sparkle there um vocally very nice kind of sort of uh what would you say a sort of cheeky chappy vocal i suppose um um i, I like that one I, th- I thought that was that was so well executed All right. Well, I appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. Over to Ian as we still await James. I don't know what's going on with James. I think he's having, again, some uh, internet connectivity issues, but Ian looks fine, so let's talk to him instead. Ian, what do you think of track number three? James has emailed me. The NSA have cut him off because they're concerned about you speaking to three Brits at once. Well, that that happens. my (laughs) My limit is two a week. So, you know, that you'll be investigated now. So it's all good. <laughs> uh, as for the song, as for the song, uh, what a great track. Uh, really nice groove, really nice vibe to it. Some of the side stick, as, as Paul was saying, the, uh, the rhythm section were tight. And that, some of the side stick that that guy was playing was really, really nice. I sort of just the little feels and that going into sections of the track. And uh, then blasting out into that sort of nice big chorus where it was driving with the, the, the full on kit and the, the, the sort of more distorted guitars going on there. Sounded great. Oh, that's James now. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to read that one out. Ah, Use okay. a bad word. All right. Um, but yeah, I mean, the groove is great. The, the vocalist, I like that sort of, it's that halfway house between kind of rapping and singing. And I kind of like the, the way that the, way the, the guy was sat on that. It was really, really nice. Um, not a lot of bad things to say. I, I hear what Paul's saying about the Rhodes piano. It, yeah, it could have done with a little bit more of that, I think. It, but that, that was a nice bit of sparkle in there. I did like that, contrasting against guitars and, and the sort of that groove and bass. So not a lot of things bad to say about this. What a good track. All right. Well, I appreciate your thoughts on that, Ian, as well. It sounds like James is not going to make it back for this round either. And that's uh, the way it happens sometimes, and uh, hopefully we'll get him to publish his thoughts on tracks two and track three on the website, so at least you won't be deprived of uh, knowing what he thinks about them as well. Track number three is uh, brought to you by uh, the Hourglass Cats. That's the name of the group. The name of the song is called Sense, 
and we appreciate their sending that track into Music Scene Investigation. Now, before we go ahead and get into our Song of the Week selection, I want to remind everybody that this Wednesday is our last hit list broadcast of the year where we'll select Aww. another band of the month based upon those artists who were selected as Song of the Weeks from last month. So you want to tune in for that. It's 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time on MusicScenInvestigation.com. If you happen to be watching this in recorded fashion, you can uh, tune in to us live there at 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday. That's Eastern Time, 10.30 p.m. GMT. Uh, so whichever uh, floats your boat is good by me. And, of course, that hit list brought to you, as always, by our friends over at Landar.com, L-A-N-D-R.com, Mastering Made Easy. Go to their website. Give it a try. You can try it for free by clicking on the Landar link below the live window on MusicScenInvestigation.com. You'll get two free uncompressed wave files mastered of your music, along with a year's worth of unlimited compressed mp3 mastering if you so desire try it out see if it works for you the winner of our hit list will get a one-year free pro account all the unlimited uncompressed masters they want made in wave files along with compressed mp3s if they so desire uh that's at landar.com we appreciate their support all right uh gentlemen i'm gonna leave it to you to uh make your decision on the song of the week. So uh, let me know what you think and uh, see what we have coming our way. I want to hear from the audience as well, because obviously with James not here, we're going to give them a say. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. We can do, we can definitely do that. I don't have a problem with that. So tell us what you think in the audience. One, two or three, what would you go for? Paul, over to you. Um, no contest for me. Uh, track three. That makes it easy for me as well. Track three is, I mean, I did like some of the ideas going on in track one and track two. I think, you know, track one was let down by the mix of production uh, and track two was let down by a lot, but there's a good song sitting there waiting to happen. Uh, but number three, production, songwriting, performances, they were all tight and you can't argue with that. So uh, good package. All right. Well, there you have it, everybody. A unanimous decision made by our panelists. And uh, I'm sure if James heard them, he, he may pick something different. But uh, if it were my decision, I'd pick three as well. So, Well, uh, the chat room's lighting up with number three. They indeed are. So number three, it is across the board unanimously. It is the Hourglass Cats, and their track Sense is our song of the week. Of course, they will compete in the hit list coming in January as we take the month of December off on our yearly hiatus where I tear things apart and rebuild the studio. Otherwise known as moving your pencil holder. Yeah, exactly. I, I wish I had a pencil holder, but I don't. All right, uh, Paul, Paul Hurst, uh, welcome and thank you for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to join us on the show today. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much. Lovely to have been invited. Thank you very much indeed. And we certainly look forward to Oddity 2, and uh, that looks like it's, it sounds great, by the way. And of course, if uh, you want to hear more of what Paul has been up to, you can go to his SoundCloud uh, site at soundcloud.com slash P underscore K underscore Hurst, H-U-R-S-T. Find out more about Paul. Paul, thanks once again. I really appreciate it. Ian, of course, thank you. And James, if you were here, I would thank you as well. And next week, we've got Mr. Ian Friedman in the guest chair, uh, a radio broadcaster and a musician. All right. Well, definitely looking forward to that. Certainly hope everybody out in the chat room joins us once again. Of course, you can download this track on iTunes and or any other podcatcher you want. You can see it out on YouTube as well, audio or video, if you're so inclined. And uh, we'll be back live again next week right here on MusicScenInvestigation.com. Right now, we're going to play out with Sense by the Hourglass Cats, our song of the week. Thanks for being here, everybody. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye. Bye now. It's
once there I will see you oh so soon But you got me drifting away way well, yeah you got me drifting away way I've got the soul thank to you helping me see every little thing that I got to do yeah sweet Mary Jane you know that you are the one for me helping me see every little thing positively you got me drifting way way yeah you got me drifting way way well, and I say that I love her And as she loves me, well, gets in the way, we'll make her so sorry. I love her. She loves me, well, gets in the way, we'll make her so sorry. You better quit stepping on my feet anymore. Know that I've been telling you this once before. Second time around, it will be twice. Second time around, I won't be so nice. I need a quick cut of my baby down. Ain't a box she grows straight from the ground. Need a quick cut of my baby down. Thought that she grows straight from the ground And when I get home at six o'clock Seems like this crime don't ever really stop Smoke a bowl to give myself some soul Seems that all these people just don't really ever know how I go The heart I got it to try And when you go, I'm never asking why Cause yeah, you got me drifting away, way Yeah, you got me drifting away, way And I'll say that I love me well gets in the way will make so sorry I love her she loves me well gets in the way will make so sorry better quit stepping on my feet anymore know that I've been telling you this once before second time around it will be twice second time around well I won't be so nice need quick cutting my baby down ain't about that she grows straight from the ground need a quick cutting my baby down ain't about that she grows Straight from the ground